All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. With my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technological discovery you should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Ella Huff. She's a junior at Cornell University pursuing a Bitcoin-focused study through Cornell's Scholar Degree Program. In addition, Ella is also the founder of the Cornell Bitcoin Club, project lead at the nonprofit organization Generation Bitcoin, co-founder of the Bitcoin Students Network, and a contributor to Bitcoin Magazine. Through her involvement, she's dedicated to helping young generations learn about and contribute to Bitcoin, and I'm super excited to talk with her today. So welcome, Ella. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thanks so much for coming on. I love loved writing this intro i mean you're doing so much and we just talked off mic like um you know sometimes i feel old even as a millennial i mean i'm 36 but you're 21 and your involvement in bitcoin is so big so i'm i'm super excited to talk with you because i think it's just really cool that you know like someone from a younger generation is all into this and uh, yeah so let's talk about that but first I wanted to check with you. I saw your Twitter bio says Generation Z marks the end of the alphabet and beginning of the future, where the B of beginning is a Bitcoin B. So how do you experience talking about Bitcoin with your generational peers? Like what are what are the 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds talking about? Yeah. So normally I just start by listening. I just kind of, you know, in my in my closer friend circle, I know what they're interested, I know what they're concerned about, thinking about. Um, so yeah, normally I just listen and see, okay, you know, what might resonate with them? Um, I have a friend, I have a lot of her family is from Russia. And so sometimes we more so talk about the ability to, you know, have money that can't be taken from you, or it really kind of varies a little bit. Um, sometimes it's just sharing history. Like I think at least in my journey of coming to learn about Bitcoin and understand Bitcoin, I just didn't know what questions to ask. I just didn't even know what I should be thinking about. And so um, sharing some history that might come up. Um, and but if I had to give like, you know, one sentence <laughs> that is sort of, I think, resonates with pretty much everybody. And I can't take credit from it uh, for this sentence. Say Fadina Moose said it, but Bitcoin and I'm paraphrasing, but Bitcoin is a tool to earn your wealth once instead of twice. And so, you know, when I'm talking to my peers, we're all in college, um, you know, starting, getting our first job, starting to think about how are we going to take care of ourselves? The I, not many people are against, yeah, I'm on board with earning my money once um, <laughs> instead of working to earn it again. So sometimes that's just a, a good hook as like a conversation starter to start thinking about. Um, yeah. And I also really emphasize you know, you don't have to change whatever you're interested in to be interested in Bitcoin. Like, because it's, you know, my personal life is, is very Bitcoin, which is my choice. It's how I want to spend my time and energy. But I just preface, you know, keep your interest what you're interested in. You know, you don't need to change that to be interested in Bitcoin. Yeah. Well, maybe that's also the entire point, right? I think if we talk about the problems that fiat money gives us is that people are doing things to earn money that they don't enjoy doing right um yeah. and because they are they are forced to to do them instead of being able to create time to explore what they actually want to do right so i think i think that's a that's a great angle so do you think like the the topic of money is a big thing or like how do how do people end up thinking about Bitcoin or asking you about Bitcoin? Like what, what are kind of like the angles where they discover it or start thinking about it? Yeah, I think it's it's hugely also dependent on where you are in the world. If you've grown up experiencing financial privilege, um, to use Alex Gladstein's term, or if you have not. And so that's just one right off uh, kind of early on that you encounter. Normally in class, um, it, I, I focus on <laughs> A lot of research topics in different classes. It's kind of inevitable to talk about it. And the other day, we had um, the program I'm in at Cornell called the College Scholar Program. We're all going around sharing our abstracts for our proposals for our thesis. All right. And then they get to mine, and everyone starts laughing. People are like, I have 
no idea what Bitcoin is, but this sounds so interesting. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's not, a, I wish I had a better, more definite answer of what's the angle people are interested in. I think it's just, you know, what's your background, your story? Um, what are you interested in currently? Like maybe if you're a communications major, all the misinformation, maybe that's interesting to you mm. and like a new case study. Maybe you're, you know, in CS and you're interested in kind of like building on lightning or whatever it might be, um, Bitcoin Core. Maybe, you know, one project in this program, they're focused on renewable energy. And so for them, like maybe it's the Bitcoin mining. Um, so it, it's a variety. And I think that's a huge gift. It's not one size fits all. It's just, you know, any person can study the aspect that resonates with them. Yeah. So lots of people have comments on millennials you know we are the trophy generation we we got trophies for participating and and stuff but i think like on gen z there's even more like comments and well uh let's call them preconceptions but i kind of like see like from my point of view i kind of see like two two sides of gen z kind of like extrapolated like they either have a very like nihilistic world view you know, it's all going to shit and it's not going to work out. And how does my future look like? And will the world still exist? And like, you know, all, all these things, like, or they have a very optimistic uh, world world view, you know, and I, 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 I lean towards the optimistic also because I think, you know, even more than like the millennial generation who got into internet, like at 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 ish. Like you grew up with the internet, you already have like all the information of the world at your fingertips, right? So how how do you look towards the future, and and what do you see your generation contribute to to the world? I mean, I think I would follow you, and that I look at the world with a very optimistic outlook. Um, I think, you know, I look, like go back to why I have Gen Z is the beginning, end of the alphabet, beginning of the future. Like this is the world that we're going to inherit. These problems are our problems that we need to you know, figure out and solve. And so, but I mean, I also know that from what I see on Twitter, sometimes like the videos of people complaining on TikTok or whatever. And so I guess that's kind of one side that you're mentioning. But in my daily life, what I see is I see like the library full of people working. I have seen friends, you know, staying up till 2 a.m. working, like people exerting energy to do good, to try to contribute to society. So I guess I would just take the optimistic view and very, um, I guess, bullish on my generation that we are not just going to say, oh, you know, forget it, like, that we are going to take action and you know, work to build a better future. Yeah. So do you think... Uh... I think like every generation points at the previous generation, right? Like how, how what is your feeling there? Like, uh, if, you know, if you follow the, the optimistic peers, like, you know, when you talk about inheriting the world, like it is like, is there a lot of finger pointing or do you think uh, people feel empowered to, to figure it out? I mean, I think finger pointing is just a waste of time. Like I personally <laughs> wouldn't, do it. Um, again, with the history, like most people do not know that the dollar's lost 98% of its purchasing power since 1971. They're not saying, like, I don't, you know, I've never heard one of my friends say, oh, Nixon, like, <laughs> you shouldn't have done that, whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, I think just finger pointing is not effective. Like, let's just mm -hmm. spend our time and energy doing something productive. And maybe you're like, spend a lot of time going down the wrong path. Like maybe the solution you think will work doesn't, but I just generally see people trying to put their energy to do something good, not just like sitting and finger pointing on the whole. Hey there, I want to ask you for a quick favor. I noticed something interesting. 75% of my viewers aren't subscribed yet. Subscribing helps me grow this channel, ensuring more great content each week. So if you're enjoying our conversations on Bitcoin for Millennials, please consider hitting the subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your favorite podcasting app. I'm super grateful for everyone who already joined and shared their thoughts. Your feedback really keeps me going. And I want to ask you to continue doing that. I try to respond to all the comments and also the emails that I get uh, and DMs on Twitter, etc. So don't stop doing that. 
I'll keep going. Now let's get back to the conversation. I recorded an episode with your mother, Lisa. And yeah. for our listeners, check out episode 30. Um, she's obviously super orange built now, but um, and I'm, I'm assuming you talk about Bitcoin with her a lot. But what was her influence on you when you know when you grew up when it when it came to like learning about money, finance, and economics? Like, how did you get into these uh, topics? Yeah, so um, I think it's always helpful to kind of you know with time you can reflect back and see what are the little I call them like dots that you collected that now you can connect. And so I remember, um, I maybe it was in sixth grade, maybe honestly, probably earlier than that, maybe fourth grade, very young. And we were at dinner, we're talking about what I'm going to study in college. And I made some comment along the lines of, oh, well, you know, I don't want to do something just for the sake of money. I, I want to do something that I enjoy. And my mom was like, no, no. <laughs> Um, you know, it is expensive to just go outside and breathe. And so we <laughs> sat down and made a spreadsheet of, you know, we looked up like, okay, what major are you kind of interested in? And I loved history. I still love history. And so we're like, okay, what's the average starting salary of a history major? Where do you want to live? You know, how much are utilities, internet, like everything. And mm. the math just doesn't work. Um, or it didn't work in that sense. So I'd say that was probably one of the first moments when I really started talking about money. And I'll also say my parents always, they, 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 I didn't have a kid's table. Like I was a part of every conversation, whether I understood what was going on or not. Um, and so then when it came time to apply to colleges, I was applying kind of CS. Um, and prior to that, now we're in a jump to high school is when my mom and I both started learning about Bitcoin, um, different avenues, but pretty much the same time. And I, my high school I was at, there was this program called the Technology Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program. And to fulfill that program, uh, you did it the whole years you were there, you had to take certain courses. So I selected the innovation strand. And one of the courses was called blockchain. That was it. And so that was really when I say I first learned about Bitcoin, but purely learned it just as distributed ledger, technology, supply chain, use cases. And I thought, okay, you know, that's cool, but not for me. I'm really interested in AI and AI ethics. Um, and at the same time, my mom, I think, read a, was reading like the MIT Tech Review, and they had something on blockchain. And so she was just, I think we're both very curious. She was just learning, okay, you know, what is this? We took the, like, Gary Gensler blockchain and money MIT open course for her together. It's pretty um, good, actually. I did it, too. Right? Yeah. And so that was really at the beginning. And she... Definitely fell down the rabbit hole first, um, but then we both went to the Oslo Freedom Forum in, I think it was like June 2022, and that is the moment for me where I say I really feel like I discovered Bitcoin, appreciated Bitcoin, and on the plane ride back was really like when I started going down the rabbit hole, when I got back, read the US budget, it was just like, what is going on in this world? Um, so we had separate but together paths. Um, and now it's, you know, such a gift to be able to talk about this with her and, um, you know, be in community with other Bitcoiners as well. Yeah. So what were the elements of Bitcoin that made up your aha moment? What, what made it click? Yeah, so... Um, there's a lot, I think it's a lot of different things building up on it. Um, there, so, okay, I mentioned like the blockchain course, also Freedom Forum, just, it's, it's really embarrassing to admit, but I had no, I had such immense financial privilege. I did not really know the concept of what, that you can just be debanked or, you know, how money can really be a tool um, to take away the rights of humans. And so that was a huge one. I had also taken a course on creativity and you had to study a creator and just think about, you know, think about things differently. Um, 
and you know what could be next. Ask questions. Don't just take established truths. And so I had all these little touch points. And then the more you learn about Bitcoin and you learn about it as a tool, you know, privacy protecting freedom technology, you learn about proof of work. But that's how our society works. Like I'm not going to graduate from college because of proof of stake. No, I have to go do my work. Yeah. Um, low time preference, delayed gratification, all of that um, really just was like, yes, this makes sense. This money system that we have before, none of that makes sense like Bitcoin does. Um, and there were some, you know, logical tidbits that you learn. And just like, of course, that's obvious. Um, yeah. So many things all contributing. So I can imagine that and maybe also because you are younger, like there are just some things that you just find very logical about Bitcoin. You know, like why why would a money system work, um, mm -hmm. you know, anywhere else? Yeah. Okay, are, are there some things that you can elaborate on? I mean, what I love about, you know, doing the podcast uh, also, mm -hmm. so again, I talked with your mom, I talked with, uh, you know, fellow millennials, but also to some boomers, right? Like everyone has something that they have to kind of change, right? Like things they thought were true or that they uh, mm -hmm. believed in a certain way or a worldview, right? And I feel mm -hmm. like the younger you get, the more logical Bitcoin sounds, but you were the perfect person to ask. So, yeah, I would say I have a couple of different things and um, analogies I always find super helpful. So, I kind of frame them in that sense. Uh, the first one being, you know, when you're little, I don't know if maybe you did this too, but you have like a piggy bank for your allowance. <laughs> if you don't know, yeah. chores, maybe you get a small allowance. And so, just the concept of when you're so young, well, you're custodying your wealth, you're, you know, little little but you're taking on the responsibility of custodying your economic energy your time your wealth and then i remember being so excited when i was i don't know 13 14 whatever and i was old enough to go and get a bank account why was i so excited to just hand over all of my <laughs> that's a good point well um yeah. that's one i think the idea of owning the same slice of something for forever like you, there's 21 million Bitcoin, whatever, however many sats you have, you know, you will always have that percent of the 21 million. Um, and then the idea, this is kind of another analogy, but, and I can't take credit for it, but we have a standard measure of time in the world. And so if money is supposed to be how we can express our preferences and value, and we have no standard unit of measurement for value, so to kind of unpack that a little bit, it, you know, you have 60 seconds in your minute, I have 60 seconds in my minute. And if our if we didn't have that, our world would be so chaotic. It would be hard to get anything done. Um, but that's the reality in money. There's, you know, 180 different fiat currencies, you know, what the number, precise number is. We have no standard unit of measurement for value. And that creates a lot of friction and you you know, add in exchange rates and the currencies themselves are changing. And so, you know, Bitcoin is just this neutral, you know, arbiter of preference of value that's accessible to all 8 billion people equitably. Just, yes, that makes sense to me. I love these two things. Like, especially the last one I think is great. Let's touch upon that. But, but yeah. the first one, like giving money to the bank, you know, it's uh, this is a great example. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this in mind because this is the thing, right? Like, um, I, I talk a lot about, you know, if 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 you know how the banking system works, right? So that takes some some studying, right? It's just so fascinating that you basically like outsource your own responsibility over your mm -hmm. own life, right? You outsource the responsibility over your own life to an organization also just made up of individual people that you couldn't name and that don't care that you know i'm me and you are you and you know that piggy bank is something you hold on to for dear life when you're younger and my my six-year-old son also has like this little wallet with his money and uh you know that's like really his thing sometimes he asks me where's my money and then i say well it's, it's here in the drawer right <laughs> and like how do we get to a point where we just give it away this is pretty it astonishing. It was exciting actually. to do it. 
I was so excited. Also, yeah, yeah. that's wild. <laughs> but did they give you like a promotion offer? Like, did they give you something? No, it wasn't. It wasn't like a credit card or anything. It was just like, um, I don't know. I was like, I, I remember I went to the bank and like I take like when I would scoop ice cream and I'd go and I'd get the the little piece of paper that then you can roll the coins up, you know, like from tips. And yeah. I was just like, oh, this is so fun. And I'm going to, I don't know why I really enjoyed doing this, but I was like, okay, I'm going to roll up my quarters and my pennies. And then I'm going to go deposit it in the bank. And I, I don't know. I think it's just something like, well, this is the default of how society works. And you were hmm. excited to participate and feel like a grown up and adult. I don't know. That was probably more that than something promotional. Like that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting yeah. because in, in my country, there's like uh, these chil children accounts, right? And they do like promotions. You get like mm -hmm. a little a little um, cash register for at home or like something with soccer or I don't know. But now that you yeah. mentioned this, like, I, I yeah, this, it's so interesting <laughs> that, you know, nobody really asked the question, what is money or how does a bank work, etc. Because it's like this... Um, how do you say this? Like it's it, it's it's like a construct in a sense, right? Like this is what you do or something, mm -hmm. but you never question it. I think this is also one of the things why when you're older, it's and it, and then you discover Bitcoin and how banking works and all these things. Like it's just way harder to accept that you were kind of like lured into this unconsciously, mm -hmm. <laughs> like without knowing how it how it works. Uh. Yeah, fascinating. So how <laughs> how do you well, maybe back to like also your peers, like do do they think about this? Like do they do they understand that the banking system is not designed to work for for you as an individual? So I would have probably had a different answer up until yesterday morning. Um I think like I think on the whole people don't realize, you know, the intricacies of the banking system. I certainly don't know all of the intricacies of the banking system, um, but I was sitting in a class yesterday, and it's a kind of like a, a network C algorithms market auction class, and they were talking about um, bonds. And anyways, they brought up uh, the like, Fed reserve rate, and I can't remember exactly the framing of it, but one guy raised his hand. He was like, well, how is this impacted given that during COVID, the reserve rate went from, you know, whatever, 10% to 0% and they haven't, you know, brought it back since COVID. How does this change? And so I didn't really think many other people were thinking about that besides me um, before. And then I'll also add, so as you mentioned, this semester, I started the Cornell Bitcoin Club and I you know, when I set out to do it, I was like, you know, this is worthwhile to do if it's just me and one other person. Um, you know, you have to have 10. So I, I knew I had like 10 people to do this with. Um, but now we have 65 people on the mailing list. And so I think oh, I'm wow. consistently really pleasantly surprised and grateful how many people, you know, are beginning to think about money and about systems that exist outside of the current system. Yeah. Wow, that's super hopeful to hear, actually. <laughs> and this is uh, why I just, I'm optimistic. And I think it's more productive to be optimistic and not just, you know, sit back and someone else will fix it. And just know, like, whatever, whoever you are, whatever, you know, you want to do, like, you can contribute. And I think that's really empowering. Yeah. So the other uh, thing you mentioned, the standard measure of value for me, that's also, it's such a logical thing, right? Because it should exist that that would actually enable global trade, right? But the fact mm -hmm. that it doesn't exist, uh, how many fiat currencies are there? You said 180? It's like 180. That is, that is like a war by itself, <laughs> right? Just the currency wars against each other. Like if my currency is, in my country is stronger than in your country, like I can persuade people to adopt my currency and then I undermine mm -hmm. yours and then I slowly take over your trade, right? Stuff like this sounds so simple. Obviously, it's it's very complex because we live in a world where this is like going on, right? Mm -hmm. But the standard measure of value, um, yeah, just makes so much sense, right? Because it, it also shouldn't really matter, you know, it, 
practically it doesn't work like this but you know if i need someone to do something for me whether they are from my country or your country or nigeria or italy yeah. Yeah. shouldn't really matter right so even if they would come over and provide the service or or give or or, or build a product for me we should be able to award people in the same in the same way all over the world and uh yeah we have a measure for time we have a measure for for distance although in america that's also yeah, different, we, right? but still. We switched. i don't know why <laughs> yeah but uh the the standard measure for value um it makes so much sense sense because at the root it's just uh, energy expenditure right mm -hmm. from whoever creates a product or a service it's energy expenditure in a certain amount of time and that's the same for everyone. So why why is the reward uh, different? Yeah, that's a great one. I'm gonna I'm gonna read up on that more because uh, perhaps we should start we should start like a petition. We should start something <laughs> to create a standard measure of value. But this angle mm -hmm. of of Bitcoin, I think, is really interesting, right? Because I think also because people have these conceptions or beliefs about money or banking or value or wealth or all, the, all mm -hmm. these things right i think that's why it's also very hard to well actually understand bitcoin because you have all these different dimensions and well things you have to challenge personally before you understand it but if we talk about the standard measure of value without mentioning bitcoin it could be a nice explanation for well, eventually we would mention Bitcoin, obviously. Yeah. But uh, I, I think it would be like a good angle for, for a conversation starter, right? I think uh, I saw a tweet today by, um, I think it's the uh, Bitwise uh, CEO. Is that Matt Hoogan? No, I think so. Uh, yeah, I think no, I was Hunter, who is, Hunter. Is Hunter from that. I Hunter. can't remember their titles. Yeah. <laughs> and he talks about, um, you know, the comparison to, calling Bitcoin digital gold is kind of mm. undermining what Bitcoin actually is, right? It's it's yeah. illustrating it because people can kind of relate to it. Mm. But at the same time, it's also undermining it a bit. Yeah, um, I think I saw that as well. And in, in the comments, or maybe that was in it, it was like, well, you know, people don't use gold that much. Like it was like, if you're saying, oh, it's just digital gold, well, then if I remember something about this gold, yeah. it was... Um, yeah, basically, like you're kind yeah. of short of what we could be. Well, it's it's only if you take certain types of um, properties from Bitcoin, right? But mm -hmm. uh, I I replied below it like it is time, and then I mentioned uh, a clip from uh, the presentation of Michael Saylor this week where he talks about this, right? Like it is not gold, it's not a commodity, it's it's engineered scarcity, and the only thing that is scarce. At real really scarce there's one thing and that is time right yeah. and yeah. there's multiple people that talk about bitcoin is time right like uh, gg has yeah. articles about yes. this <laughs> well and so uh, you know if you if you walk that path then you would end up at you know well if we have a measurement for time then bitcoin could be the measurement for value right so uh yeah i love that i love that angle so how how has bitcoin changed your world for you i mean well you went to the oslo freedom forum two two yeah. two years ago or 18 months ago like was that one of those well you shared it was one of those moments but like how mm -hmm. how do you look at the world you have this optimistic outlook but yeah. what is your view of the world well i think i've also been very fortunate in that i am learning about bitcoin so early and that's what, you know, another reason why I really think it's important that people my age, younger, just learn about Bitcoin now. There's a, I've noticed there's a tendency to just push off kind of thinking about money or, you know, I don't have time for that just because of, it's like we can't get out of the system that just does everything to keep us in it. And so I feel very grateful to have learned about Bitcoin now and it being really formative in my worldview or enhancing my worldview you know i have wonderful parents who i think really did a good job of you know teaching me about the world and how to act in the world um but learning about bitcoin and bitcoin is money and the concept that money is a tool to shape reality and the the reality we live in is one that has a lot of greed and dishonesty and 
then Bitcoin presenting itself as, okay, well, this is something that we could, a tool we can use to build a more honest future, a more honest reality. So that's, you know, one shape of my worldview. Um, and then I think just on the, like stepping back a little bit, it's really empowering to be a part of something so much bigger than yourself and something that encourages you to think for yourself and where it's a norm to, you know, don't trust verify, do your proof of work, first principles thinking. And so it's almost like, you know, Bitcoin shapes my worldview or helps shape it, but also it's at the same time telling me, you know, you go shape your world for you, you go make a uh, decision of an opinion. Um, and so that's an aspect that I appreciate. And another thing I try to share with friends. Um, and yeah, so I think one final point I heard on a podcast a couple of months ago now, and they basically just said, you know, if you have life, you have purpose, go find it. And so for me, I feel really grateful to have found Bitcoin and to be able to put my time and energy into this system. And something else I tell my friends though is, but that you don't have to choose to do that. Like Bitcoin can just be money for you that allows you to save and then have the ability to choose and think and act in a way that aligns with your values. So I yeah. guess to put a bow on it, like it's shaped my worldview and also taught me how to shape my worldview for myself. I love that. I wish I would have that. <laughs> I had that when I was 21, but I think that's great, right? Like I, 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 I love hearing this because for me, this is also, I think, what strengthens my positive outlook for the future, right? Like the fact that yeah. you can find your purpose at such a young age, that's amazing. Like, I love that you're sharing that, right? I, uh, I, had, a, I had a conversation on, on another podcast with, uh, with Luke Broyles about like trying to contribute to Bitcoin, as you mentioned also, you know, in whatever way. I mean, I just started another podcast, you know. Oh my gosh. But uh no, I mean this one, right? Like oh, another okay. bit, another I bit. thought you were starting <laughs> no, another no, no, podcast. No, no. I was like, no, oh no, gosh. No. no, no. But like the the act of sharing is already the inspiration, yeah. I think. Right. And it doesn't really matter what what you do once you see that you know, Bitcoin is something that could really change the world, then it doesn't really matter how you can contribute. Right. And even, you know, what you say to your friends, I think, right, like if they adopt it as their money or their way of, of saving their wealth or building their wealth towards the future, they are also contributing to to Bitcoin, right? Because they are they are going to be users of it. So yeah, I love that explanation because it's just it, it doesn't really matter where you come from or what you do, like you can contribute in any way. And that also ties into I think some of the dimensions of Bitcoin, right? Like the permissionless uh, mm -hmm. aspect or the trustless aspect or the apolitical, a-religious, all these things. Like it doesn't matter who you are and where you come from. Like uh, anyone can, mm -hmm. can contribute to this. And so what you said about the honesty point, uh, I really like that too, right? Because I think yeah, Bitcoin forces transparency. So it forces you to add value. And if you don't add enough value and people don't want to, share their Bitcoin with you, then you should just go and do something else, right? Like I mm -hmm. think it's actually the perfect maybe cure for capitalism <laughs> in a sense that it would really work, right? Like if you are better at baking cakes than I am, then, you know, I'm going to do something else and you win and that's all good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think I think that's a really, uh, that's a really nice point. So if we move on to what you're doing at Cornell, you are studying Bitcoin. How did you manage to get that through at, at a top university like Cornell? How did, how did that go? Yes. So it was a long process, I guess, to, for an overview. It took about 15 months to do. Wow. And so I had spent my, um, for some context, I spent my junior year of high school in Beijing until COVID uh, broke out and we all had to go home. Uh, but I... That really wanted to go back after that happened. And so I spent my freshman year at NYU Shanghai, although that was uh, all remote because of COVID again, um, but because I did not get into Cornell um, initially, I received the transfer offer. So it was, you know, you can come as a sophomore, but not as a freshman. 
And so it was during, you know, that time that I was really down the like AI ethics, um, was really interested in Chinese and the characters and you know, that's a whole nother topic. Uh, but I say, you know, well, that just say spending a lot of time at home, not on a campus in that freshman year, I was able to think about Bitcoin, and learn more about it. And then I went to the Oslo Freedom Forum that summer, right before I was going to Cornell. And then I got to Cornell and learned that they had an independent major program. I was like, I have to do Bitcoin. I have to figure out how to study this. And so I started it, you know, I think September, October, right when I got there. And uh, it didn't, it wasn't much success. It was a lot of, you know, we don't think it's a good idea for you to study something that's 14, 15 years old. Uh, we think you could really benefit from an established curriculum. How about you study the gold standard, blockchains, the true innovation, not Bitcoin here. And I just kept persisting. I just took all the no's as not yet. And just because, you know, once you're, once you see Bitcoin, as people say, you can't unsee it. I was like, this is not something that I'm willing to give up trying to say that I think it's important that I spend my time doing this. So anyways, I spent the whole year doing that. I couldn't um, ever quite find a faculty to also serve as a sponsor for that major. And then circle around to the beginning of this year, um, I received a new academic advisor and she graduated from Cornell. She's an alumna and she did this program called the College Scholar Program. Uh, now it's the Robert S. Harrison College Program. And she was telling me about it. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I know I'm a year late in applying, but is there any way I can apply? I've been trying to do this independent major. I can't seem to get, you know, much traction on it. And she was like, oh, I don't, I don't know. Um, anyways, they let me apply <laughs> during the exams of December. And then it was approved in January. So this program, it's a little bit more supportive or maybe more established than the independent major program was. So I'm a big believer in things always work out. So right now I'm working on putting together my committee or kind of my board for my uh, oral defense that I'll do next spring for the thesis that I'll write next year. And there's, you know, a couple classes that you take. And you're in a cohort. So there's about 60 people on campus all doing different things. And it's like, it's so energizing and hopeful for me because I, you know, go to that seminar and I hear people talking about their ideas that like are so interesting. It's like, this is what education is supposed to be. Like, this is what sound money allows us to do. It's just go be curious, think differently. So anyways, um, my thesis right now, the title is kind of, uh, what my Twitter handle, um, showing that the 21 million Bitcoin are tools for the 21st century. And I right now have honed it down to look at um, the economic, energy, and linguistics components or to kind of prove that thesis from those angles. So yes, that will really all kick off next year. Um, and then I have a couple other like minors, majors, but I, I get to choose all my courses. And it's really just your intellectual freedom. Amazing. Amazing. So what is the linguistics aspect there? Yes. And so this is the worst that I am. This is the one that I'm worst at saying uh, concisely <laughs> for this, because I'm still like going through this all in my head. Um, so let me try it. And I was, I could not sleep last night because I was thinking, okay. <laughs> um, but essentially, you know, if money is how we express our preferences and values and language, I took a class previously and it introduced the idea of the language game and how just like you and I right now, we're playing a language game. You know, can I understand your meaning? Can you understand mine? And if we both can, then we won. But if you think of just like a water bottle, like the bottleneck, it's really hard to get all the meaning that I want to share to you through that and vice versa. So there's different tools and strategies that we enact. But the point is that, you know, then once you think about people who speak different language, it's just, it's hard, just in spoken language to communicate our preferences. And so I, when I start, I took that class, I started thinking about Bitcoin and well, okay, Bitcoin is this language in a sense that allows us to communicate with people worldwide and say, you know, I value your your energy, who you are, what you do, 
in a way that we've never really been able to before. And um, so that's kind of one thought process of this. Another is just, you know, code being speech, language is power, mm. you know, money is power. Yeah. Transactions, you have the linguistics component. And then the part I was thinking about last night, it's still like very rough, but uh, just how words are a little bit like a safe and you can see a word, you can see it, but you don't always know the meaning. Like it takes a lot of, you have to, you know, spend time to unlock that meaning. And so I was just thinking about like Bitcoin as a word, um, a peer to peer electronic cash system. There's so much in all of that that the more time you spend learning, you actually appreciate. Like the first time I heard electronic cash system, I had no idea the benefits of cash, of what you get when something's electronic. So anyways, that was a little bit jumbled, um, but I think- No, not at you all. Know, I'll, I'll flesh all. it out, but I, I love thinking about this. Um, and we'll maybe, I'll, uh, yeah, maybe. Work well, for the, for, the first, for, the first, for the first part, I'm thinking about um what you said about my i don't know who said this i feel well someone in bitcoin maybe breed love probably but <laughs> like the money is a is a it's also it's a tool for communication also right like mm -hmm. as you said the value exchange is i communicate to you i can do xyz for you or yeah. i can um you know build or give you product abc whatever i create it right and so i communicate what value i can bring to you right mm -hmm. and my job is that to do that to the best of my ability which basically starts with you know ella i understand the problem you have and therefore this is my solution right yeah. and then when you are accepting that that is when mm -hmm. we basically shake hands and do this value exchange right yeah. and so i think that is a a, a very clear form of communication right but then the technology we use to actually exchange the value right on one side it's me expending my energy in a time to do the thing that i give to you right and on the other hand uh, other side is you using well fiat money to basically communicate back you know this is the value you deliver to me packaged in you know the money the money that we use but because that money is corrupted our communication gets corrupted mm -hmm. maybe not at the moment when we shake hands and do the exchange right because at that you know that moment in the now now you know at that yeah. moment that we shake hands it's it's equal but after that the the reward that i got starts to deteriorate in value right mm -hmm. and so therefore at the moment of us communicating our exchange got corrupted because well basically an external technology uh well it, it that corrupted it right and so when you mention this i think about bitcoin is actually a tool that enables us to keep that that value that we exchange right i give you a product or a service and you give me the reward in return and that's and that stays equal you know, so it it um, it solves the, that corrupted communication. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of what I thought about. <laughs> no, I love that. Yeah. So this is that's probably the section that I am most interested in, and the one that I am worst at expressing right now. If I don't write about something, I'm like organize my ideas. I can't yeah. express it. But I I think it's fascinating to think about. It. Yeah. Well, I think this is part of the paradigm shift mm -hmm. because if we can have equal exchanges all the time with anyone anywhere in the world mm -hmm. that's going to be a very positive game instead of a zero-sum game right that mm -hmm. field enables so yeah to me that's part of the paradigm in a sense like that that just shifts everything to a more positive uh world in a sense all right nice so mm -hmm. tell me about the bitcoin students network yes. how that is going and how anyone listening who is a student or not, yeah. I don't know, can contribute to the network and, and the nonprofit you're building. Yes, well, anyone can contribute, not just students. Um, so we launched the Bitcoin Students Network in March of this year. 
And the Students Network is an initiative of Generation Bitcoin, which is a nonprofit uh, focused on providing, you know, education and job opportunities for, as the name would success, uh, suggest, uh, Generation Bitcoin, kind of the younger generations. And I did not found that. Um, Arsh Malu, who works at the Human Rights Foundation, and Shana Mizra, who's the youngest Bitcoin core contributor, and Autumn Domingo, uh, who is a freshman in college, and she's done a lot of Bitcoin UI UX work. They started it a couple of years ago, and then I joined them a couple of years ago as well. And Arsh and I uh, co-founded the Bitcoin Students Network this year. And it has the, really the same missions, but a little bit more targeted of an audience. And so it's about the 18 to 22 year old range. You don't necessarily have to be a student in a university, um, but it is the mission there is how do we grow and scale Bitcoin clubs? And so there's kind of three different verticals of resources that we're putting together. So logistics, how do you start a Bitcoin club? What should you think about? What are best practices? Um, educational, it can, it's really time consuming to, you know, run a meeting. And so we're building out a kind of repository of workshops and then financial. Uh, some universities give budgets to clubs, others don't. So we don't want that to be a hindrance. Um, also help students get to conferences or, you know, buy a book, <laughs> something of that nature. And then another really huge piece that we're working on is the jobs front, because it's hard to say, you know, yes, I will spend my time thinking about Bitcoin or, you know, this, if, if you don't see any path for you to contribute or uh, work on in the future, especially if you're in university where you're just so focused on, okay, well, what am I going to do to get my summer internship or whatever? Just having the jobs is a way to just build a more sustainable uh, investigation and interest in Bitcoin. So right now we have about, uh, we have kind of nodes in this network in about 26 different countries. So it's, it's worldwide. It's not just the U.S. Uh, we have an incredible board of advisors. Uh, there's 12 of them across various different uh, teams to help kind of support what our mission and yes if you are a student please be in touch we'd love to support you even if you're just one person you know right now and you're interested in starting a bitcoin club we like there's been fun stories of like multiple people from the same university filling out our interest form and then you know kind of connect with them nice. um also if you are an individual you know maybe you can go volunteer to give an hour lesson at your local university or if you're a company uh, and you'd like to take on some interns or do a workshop or a panel uh, really anything you can contribute is most appreciative and we need to be most grateful to chat awesome i will make sure to link to everything in the in the show notes so people can check it out and uh, well hopefully some people are listening that could contribute mm -hmm. if uh, I, I don't know if you're already in the netherlands but as mentioned uh, before uh i will definitely try to help you and connect Thank with uh, some universities here so uh let's see if that we can uh, if we can make that work yes. all right so what advice would you give someone who is just starting to explore bitcoin you know we mentioned the different dimensions that you know bitcoin has so you know it's yeah. it's i would say it's pretty daunting to get started but uh, what would be your advice to start just you know think about what are you just what are you interested in like i don't know maybe it's like gardening and then you're interested in the kind of the regenerative agriculture topic of bitcoin there's so much <laughs> in this space yeah. um so i would say to start, if you look, if you have a meetup, I think the community of Bitcoin is it's really special. And I promise if you just go to a meetup, people will be so glad to meet and talk with you. Um, and yeah, I, mean, I think really just start, you know, listen to podcasts like yours. Um, and then I'd also just to kind of give a framework you've probably seen kind of like the the graph where it's like i know nothing on the like the left side of the graph and then <laughs> yeah, in the middle yeah, you're yeah. like i'm so smart i know everything and then and time is on like the x-axis i think yeah and then on the right you're back to i know nothing 
most days I feel like I know so little, but I take that as a gift, a privilege to just have something that makes me curious and teaches me. So just, you know, people that have been thinking about this for, you know, four years, 10 years, sometimes also feel like they know nothing. So focus on what you're interested in, go find, you know, local Bitcoiners. And yeah, there's, you know, just, just start. It's a good point about uh, feeling uh, I, n I know nothing. I had the same when uh, I watched this uh, clip I just mentioned from Sailor, you know, or that presentation. It's again, I thought, you know, after 10 years, I know my stuff, but, you know, I have my mind blown every week, I think, <laughs> still. But that's also the fun part, right? I mm -hmm. think, uh, you know, when you start, there's so much content, there's so many different voices from different backgrounds, um, talking also about all these different dimensions, right? So there is already so much for you to, to explore. And, uh, yeah, once you realize that, you know, how we communicate value with each other is probably the root of everything you would want to fix in the world mm -hmm. that yeah. you don't like, uh, you know, of which you don't like how it is right now, then the rabbit hole is probably endless in that way, right? Like uh, the, the how we communicate value with each other is where all the problems come from. Yeah. And if we fix that, we really fix the world, right? So I think... Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's um, well, perhaps it's less daunting. I think it's just more more daunting because there is so much content, right? But it's just like it doesn't. Maybe the the your answer is best. Like it just start, and it doesn't matter where you start yeah. because you will find these other dimensions. Exactly, and I I also so at Bitblock Boom a couple of weeks ago, John Bay gave a good uh, strategy that he does when he's maybe onboarding new groups and they do an exercise like in the firehouse or wherever and they put like one dollar into bitcoin two dollars and just like mm -hmm. low stakes exercises of, and this is you know i always tell people you know my intent is not for you to go buy bitcoin my intent is just for you to think about this and so but they just use like okay it's it's two dollars like who cares if we mess this up who cares if like you know this is turns wrong it's just mm -hmm. like just start small and you know it's also you don't need to have some big expectation that bitcoin's going to take over your life or that you're going to spend all your time doing this like it can just be money it can just be a vessel for you to save your energy for generations and that's it so yeah just yeah, I agree. And probably once you start, you will find the rabbit hole if you pay. Yeah. Once you, once you're in, you spend yeah, enough time, is. and then uh, you will think about it every day. But, <laughs> um, yeah. So, do you see Bitcoin as like technological discovery, or also as as kind of like a philosophy? Oh, does it ever have to choose one? Ready? No. no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, I think it's. I definitely think it was a discovery as opposed to an invention. Um, and I guess, well, maybe I might ask you more on the philosophy side of things. Like I love the philosophical take on it. Um, I just read Resistance Money, you know, written by three philosophers. And so I guess, you know, what is, how, how do you interpret Bitcoin being a philosophy? For me, it kind of ties into um, the the part that I just mentioned about, you know, the and this is also what I learned along the way, you know, the real yeah. free market is I find you or you find me mm -hmm. and we agree that we want to have a, an exchange of value, whatever it is. And that should really be only up to us. And the fact that it is corrupted in a way that we don't understand, or well, 99.9% .9 of the people don't understand that unconsciously influences our life in the way that we um, well, spend our time, which is our most scarce asset, right? And I think that is limiting us in, in what, what we can do, right? As I mentioned in the beginning, like the, the, the fact that we don't have the space, again, that's time for me, to figure out, you know, what am I here to contribute? Mm -hmm. I find that a really big thing. And 
it's funny because I only got there because I created the time to think about, you know, mm -hmm. why don't people exactly. have the time? So it's, 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 a, it's a interesting. But I think yeah. once you can control your time, like really control mm -hmm. your time, that actually frees up your mind in a sense mm -hmm. because yeah. there's so many things in your mind that are there not because you want to, but because there are third parties that create certain environments that force you to put those things in your head. Um, yeah, so I think you're not really free. Although, you know, we live in free countries and, you know, we have freedom of speech and blah, blah, but you're not really free. Mm -hmm. There's still other people that influence your life and not in a good way. And so, you know, once you understand that you can adopt a tool that can help you be more free, mm -hmm. well, then, yeah, for me, that that is kind of like the the philosophy part in that way mm -hmm. that that you can actually get there like there's mm -hmm. a real chance that you can get there instead of just hoping for it yeah. or you know fantasizing about it in a way mm -hmm. yeah yeah no, i would agree and i think it goes back to what you said in the beginning that we tend to outsource our agency and responsibility and bitcoin allows you to reclaim that yeah so well maybe this is a good one because i wanted to ask you what what is like an interesting Bitcoin tweet or article? You know, this is something I want to introduce here in the podcast. Like I want to just get our content and then share it, you know, with the people <laughs> listening. But like what's, what's an interesting tweet, article, podcast or video that you've come across that, that you love to share? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I think, uh, well, Natalie Smolensky, I just hugely, you know, look up to her, <laughs> respect her. And she had a tweet the other day. And it was basically just about the importance of maintaining integrity, like the road ahead of us. It's going to be hard. Um, it will, I might now be extrapolating, but it will be long, like it won't be easy, but we really have to make sure that we are acting with integrity and staying true to sound values and not getting caught up in ego or uh, high time preference. And I just... Yeah, it really resonated with me um, earlier at the end of last year. I kind of saw something in my my you know immediate world where there you know a lack of integrity or you know where identity and expediency really had a bad impact, and so I just read this and it just resonated. Yeah, so you send me the link. I'll look it up. Oh yeah, she I said... can. I can. Uh... Oh, no, you, no, you I'll, have it. <laughs> I'll, I'll read it. Yeah, I got it. So she says, things are dark and they're going to get much darker. Our moral and intellectual North Star must remain functioning from principle instead of identity and expediency. Thinking and acting from principle is revolutionary. It transforms the world. Cheers to all fellow travelers on the road ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, for me, it ties a bit into to what, well, what, what I just said, like the, once you can I, I don't know how it worked, but I think once you adopt Bitcoin, you adopt, I think, a certain trust in yourself mm -hmm. that you, well, yeah, that you can trust yourself and, you know, your own moral compass and that you are right to a degree, you know, that, that, that you set out on a certain path and that that's okay mm -hmm. and that you see what can be as a what, what like what can be there as a reward of following that path right and then it doesn't really matter you know what the obstacles are that you mm -hmm. that you come across because you know that you are on your on your path in a sense um so i love that you shared that yeah yeah and i think you know the future is just inherently uncertain and i've realize that a tool or a framework to think about well how do you handle uncertainty is just what type of person do I want to be? What type of values do I want to embody? And when I learned about Bitcoin and the, the values we've spoken about, you know, it, it embodies the values that I would want to express um, on my best day. And so, you know, that's a system that I want to put my energy into. And then I think, you know, as she kind of mentioned, and this is my interpretation as well, but we can't define all the steps ahead of time of, what will get us to the right destination or how we should be moral. And that's different for everyone. But I think, you know, Bitcoin, just how it was constructed, the values it leaves us with, as you were speaking at, 
it helps us get to the right destination. Like if we just kind of, you know, put our time into it and, you know, try to act with the best and the most, you know, integrity, then we'll, we'll end up where we're supposed to be. And so, yeah, I just, I read that and it, it really resonated. It's funny because now that you say this, I think about the proof of work, do the work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? And you can only do the work if you uh, really integrate where you're going, right? Like if, mm -hmm. if you anchor to that point on the horizon where you're going, then you are also motivated to do the work. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So to end our conversation, I will ask you what I ask everyone at the end. Okay. And that's what is a core belief you will never let go? Yeah, mine's really short. Uh, community is everything. Yeah. Can you elaborate a bit? Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it's just, you know, your community, small or large, it's, uh, and I think, you know, I, I've learned to a certain extent what it's like to lose community, gain community, you know, be a good community member. I somehow, I, I went to, I think, seven different schools in eight years. And so I was moving all the time and, you know, rebuilding community and finding your people again. And I also grew up and I never really had social media before Twitter. And so I, uh, I think my mom taught me this thing where you just reach out to two people you don't normally speak to every week. And so as I'm going through these seven different schools, eight years, like you, you, you meet a lot of different people and those people just i think you know the idea of dots again just the people you're around the people who are there for you the people who you can support and celebrate and cheer on like that's why we're here you know that's just for me what has felt uh centering or grounding or just like especially with bitcoin like we are here to support a mission that protects human flourishing and individual you know sovereignty for all eight billion people like it embodies community as everything and supporting our community members. Love that. Great ending. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Um, as mentioned, I will link to, you know, Generation Bitcoin, your students network, your Twitter, so people can follow your journey and hopefully also contribute to what you're building. So thanks so much. We'll be in Thank touch you. and say hi to your mom. I will. <laughs> Thank you so much okay. for having me. <laughs> Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.